what since the second half really how much they've really struggled charged with finding some stability from this welcome back to the next episode of the journey of a grassroots rugby coach more track suits less business suits and today i'm speaking with tom walsh tom's originally from london but he's now based in berlin He's travelled the world to learn about various codes of rugby in Fiji, New Zealand, Australia and parts of Europe and Asia. He's coached touch football to beginners and worked with academy youth internationals in league and union. He's seen a variety of approaches to varying levels and he's always happy to share his success and solutions with other grassroots coaches. As well as being involved in coach education, he works as an S&C for Autonomy Gaps which is a people-focused um, S&C company that works on speed development and injury prevention. And I'll put the links to that in our show notes. I took a heap of notes away from this. Um, Tom was really grateful with his time. So I hope you get something out of this and enjoy it as much as I enjoyed chatting to Tom. So I figured if I went to Fiji, spent a season there, I'd come back and I'd be the you know, best rugby player in England. Uh, so instead of going to university, uh, when I was 18, I just hopped on a plane, went over to Fiji, and yeah. I'd managed to link up with a guy there who he'd played for the Barbars. He'd come over and played for Barbars in England, and he had said, "If I came to Fiji, I could stay at his house." And uh, I rocked up at the airport. And he was there to pick me up, which was a surprise because he was pretty unreliable. I found out, <laughs> um, and he said, um, "Do you know?" do you know I said you could stay at my house and I was like yeah and he said you're gonna have to help me build it <laughs> so, he can't find it. That's a mighty shot. A mighty Mark Lester. all right so let's get underway mate um so just for the listeners Tom if you just want to give the 30 second version of who you are where you are in the world at the moment and what's what what are you coaching at the moment? Um, at the moment, I'm in Berlin, and um, I've, kind of, I've kind of been a bit lucky with the rugby stuff. <clears throat> I'm a strength and conditioning coach, but um, I coach grassroots rugby, and uh, I was kind of lucky that I got to live in Fiji in late '90s. Got to see how they do sevens. Um, got to live in uh, New Zealand and Australia. Um, so I've been exposed to union touch and league, um, both as a player and a coach, and I've got to see where people do it best. And i um, currently doing a little bit of rugby union and trying to start up league here in Berlin and trying to uh, start up a touch team as well at the same time. Sounds like you're busy, mate. <laughs> Some of them, some of it's going to have to go. How, how does how are you going with it over there in a um, non rugby playing nation? It's it's tough because um, it's really it's really uh, interesting because like a lot of places, if you go somewhere and you'd be like, "Oh, I've done like some seven stuff in Fiji," they want to lap it up. Yeah, um, and even if they don't agree with you they want to hear what you have to say before they, they say that you're wrong or something or they say their way is better. But it's interesting here that um, people are like really fixed in their ways and they're really out of date. So I'm like, I'm seeing stuff here that I haven't seen since the late nineties. Um, <laughs> I haven't seen anyone else doing it. And then you see stuff like you don't see anywhere else. Like I've never seen this before, but you see kids who like, um, you know, they'll throw like a perfect sort of Cameron Smith pass, just throw like six o'clock pass, you know, yeah. two-handed straight to their parent. And the parent will be like, no, 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 that's wrong. You have to spin it. Um, and there's no context of like where you'd spin in certain situations, but in situations you wouldn't, there's none of that. So you'll get like kids like putting a hand on top of the ball and spinning it the wrong way, oh, trying to copy yeah. it. It's terrible stuff like that. And um, when the pass they did was fine, you'll see kids like making breaks and they'll make a great break, tuck the ball under one arm and just go. And the coach will shout, ball in two hands. And yeah. it's like, there's, no, there's no one in front of you. <laughs> it's it's yeah, stuff they... like that. So they latch on like these, like, uh, they latch on these little things. 
and they're, they're just uh, there's no kind of frame of reference there's no common sense and they're completely inflexible about it uh, so yeah you de you're dealing with that it's um it's maddening <laughs> <laughs> yeah i thought it was, it's difficult in a non-rugby state but i've never I've ne never really thought about it till today about trying to coach it in a, in a non-rugby country and in a country that's so mad on soccer well you, you say that but the thing is here they've got like, amazing facilities um, yeah. And they've got like really good athletes. So what they do is because they're playing soccer, handball, basketball, you're producing really, really good athletes. Yeah. And so you'll turn up at training and you'll get guys who it's their first get, first day at rugby and they, someone puts up a high ball and they catch it. Yeah. And the guy, the guy who's never played rugby before, he'll pick off a couple of interceptions because he'll just have an understanding from playing basketball and an understanding of time and space. Like, well, look, this guy's about to pass to this guy. I'm just going to take that. So it's not that they're actually, the players are bad, it's the coaching. So yeah. it's, it's the case of the old thing is that you can't turn a donkey into a thoroughbred. Yeah. Like he, here they're actually turning thoroughbreds into donkeys. Okay. Because they've got guys, they can run, they can catch, they can pass, they can kick. They're not afraid of taking a hit. They're not afraid of dishing one out. Yeah. But then they'll try and say, uh, I'm going to try and put you in a structure that's based on top 14, where you can't make decisions. It's too complicated for you. Mm. When you can't do it, I'm going to shout at you. So when you're 16, you leave the sport. Yeah. Because you just had enough. You haven't had any decision-making skills developed. And it's not fun. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's not fun. And... Yeah you don't you don't enjoy it because you're too too structured in what you're trying to do and yeah oh there's a whole there's a whole lot of discussions around that maybe for another day <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so we'll talk about at the moment <laughs> uh, sound like you've got an interesting uh couple of months ahead of you by the sound, or a couple of years by the sounds of it well we'll um, see we'll see <laughs> okay um so you briefly touched on it um, in your little intro there, mate, but um, how did you get into coaching? Well, and you can reflect on your SNC stuff or your rugby stuff or any of the coaching stuff that you do. Um, how did you get into it or, or why do you do it? I mean, I think I, I started coaching athletics back when I was still sprinting. Like, I think it was like 97, I started coaching athletics. And I think I started coaching rugby really in 99 which was kind of like the club was running stuff and like if you showed up there'd be some players from like the local premiership team there and so you just sort of showed up you know um but i think i really started doing it seriously uh because i got like that sort of bug for when you see something improve yeah. if someone turns up they can't do something, you know what the thing is that they need to fix, you give it to them and you just see it in that session. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that's something that still, I haven't really lost that sense of excitement over, of being able to identify the thing that the person needs and being able to give it to them. Um, and I think that's like just just being around the banter or just, um, you, know, you know, other jobs, like you're looking at the watch because you know, oh, 10 more minutes and I can leave work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where, whereas with coaching, I'll be like, 10 more minutes is all I've got. Yeah. And then at the end of that 10 minutes, like I've got to, you know, I've got to get what we need to do in this 10 minutes. And you, you yeah. want more time, you'd stay for another hour if you could. Um, yeah, but you got the phone going off in your pocket saying, when are you going to be home? When are you going to be home? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I usually turn that off. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry, I couldn't have my phone on the field. <laughs> yeah, no, I completely understand that, mate. Um, so <clears throat> you said in your intro that like you lived in Fiji for a while and New Zealand. Um, what, what prompted that? Was that part of your coaching journey or was it just something you just went there and... So I was, I was uh, I think I was like 18, uh, 17, 18. And I, I sort of figured that I could see what was coming out of Fiji, like um, 
uh, like people like Sir Revy. Yep. And I figured that if you, I wasn't a very gifted player, but I figured I didn't really understand genetics and like, you know, the, when you need to be exposed to certain motor skills at certain ages, I just figured if you work hard enough, you could be as good as you wanted to be. Mm-hmm. So I figured if I went to Fiji, spent a season there, I'd come back and I'd be, you know, best rugby player in England. Uh, so instead of going to university, uh, when I was 18, I just hopped on a plane, went over to Fiji and yeah. I'd managed to link up with a guy there who he'd played for the Barbars. He'd come over and played for the Barbars in England. And he had said, if I came to Fiji, I could stay at his house. And uh, I rocked up at the airport and he was there to pick me up, which was a surprise because he was pretty unreliable, I found out. <laughs> um, and he said, um, do you know... Do you know I said you could stay at my house? And I was like, yeah. And he said, you're going to have to help me build it. <laughs> so, so I'm sort of like fresh off the plane. I'm 18 years old or something. I end up like staying in this place, you know, that we made ourselves out of tin. Uh, no running water, no electricity. I've still got like the scars where I got boils because I wasn't cleaning myself properly and all the rest of it. Um, I hurt my back. I didn't really got to play much there. I hurt my back jumping out of a tree, being an idiot. Um, but um, I learned stuff while I was there, getting to train with those people and just getting to see how they made space for each other. Mm. Um, and the amount of tries they scored off, like just really, really, really simple moves done fast. And then retrospectively seeing like how much time they just spent playing touch in the mud. Yeah, uh, and I see it now. All these people they talk about like talent development pathways and academies and like the facilities and the equipment, and it's like what those guys manage to produce with just having mud, a beach, and if they didn't even have a ball, they'd get a coke bottle and fill it with water and throw that around. Yeah, or a pair um, of flip flops or something was the ball. Yeah, something was the bare ball. feet. Yeah. Most yeah. of them played in bare feet all yeah. the time. The amount of pairs of boots that I had stolen or lent to people and they never got back because a lot of these guys didn't have their own boots um but they from a talent development point of view they didn't need it um but yeah so uh, it didn't turn out the way i wanted it to um but but it it was an incredible like learning experience and um and i ended up i ended up like uh getting to live with serevi for a couple of weeks i think it was and he said that he said that um i could come play with his club like i'd be nine and he'd be ten yeah. which was no way near was I good enough. Like, not like I, I wouldn't have had a shit show in hell of being picked for that club. Mm. But it was just a kind of like nice token gesture for this like random white kid who showed up. Yeah. And the week before that happened, both the tens in the Fiji camp uh, knocked heads and knocked each other out. And he had to be called up for the, I think it was the Fiji Samoa game in the, what was then the Pacific Rim. Yeah. Um, so I never got to actually go, go, go and play with him and the rest of it. Um, but, um, but it was just interesting seeing how he trained because uh, I got to train with him and he went to like the army base and he did weights and he went to his club and, you know, just, just being around that, seeing yeah. what those guys did. It was, it was really interesting. And uh, like at the time, I didn't probably appreciate what I was learning. It's only like retrospectively uh, yeah, what I managed yeah. to sort of put together from that. It's been really cool. Yeah. No, that's really interesting. That that's um, a good experience as a as a player and just as a young bloke seeing the world too. I suppose it was pretty mad at the time. <laughs> It'd be a bit Fiji's a bit different to the UK. Yeah, yeah slightly. Yeah, slightly. Even even just the weather would have been unbelievable. I don't think they have bad days over there except when the cyclones come through. Um. So think thinking back over your coaching. Um, journey so far, mate. What's what's one of the biggest heartbreaks or one of the biggest disappointments you've had as a coach? To be honest, like I think I've got quite good at letting things go because mm-hmm. I think most of it is actually quite disappointing because you'll go in with like really high expectations, wanting the best. Uh, either wanting the best from yourself or wanting the best from like the people you're working with and 
people usually don't, they're, they're usually not as driven. Yeah. You know, and even when you do find the people who are driven, things often go wrong. Like they get injured or they don't get picked for the things that they deserve to get picked for. Um, and I just, I just found that like, if you just keep focusing on like, what are you trying to get out of it? And what do the people that you work with want to get out of it? Out of it? Yeah. There's always something over the hill. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's always something over the hill. And um, yeah, it's just, I, none of it's fair. Uh, but that's like, I think that's one of the best things that you get out of it is that it prepares you for life. It's like how you react when things aren't fair. Yeah. Uh, uh, how you, and how you keep moving. Um, and I, I deliberately, like, I, I mean, training unfair. Like, I'll single guys out. Yeah. And I'll say, I'm going to single you out today and I'm going to give you a hard time. And I'm, I'm going to unfairly penalise you and stuff like that. Yeah. And I just want you to, when it happens, you can get angry or you can just look and go, what's the next job I can do? What's in my control? Yeah. So, yeah, I just... Uh, I've probably got one or two that I probably don't want to say, you know, in public. No, um, that's, and, that, and that's fine, mate. We've all got a few of those somewhere in our, in our past. Um, you know, I, keep, I can actually keep moving, I think, with it, because there's always yep. something else that needs to be done. Yep. You know? Okay, so have, what about some of your greatest moments then as a coach? I've had two, actually, that I think I really I learned a lot from. One, I was, do I was doing this thing in, a, in an orphanage in Hong Kong. And we used to do this thing. Well, I worked for Hong Kong Rugby. They'd send us into this orphanage and you'd just play games with the kids. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I had a pair of sunglasses on my head. And they fell off. And this kid grabbed them. And then it was just me on the basketball running around after this kid trying to get my sunglasses back. So he was like throwing them to the other kid the moment I was about to catch him. And then I just noticed this game just developed organically where they understood I wanted my sunglasses back and it yeah. was fun for them to make sure I didn't get it. And their understanding of when they needed to throw the sunglasses and where they needed to be to catch it was perfect. Mm -hmm. And they got no direction from me. They'd got no drills. They'd got no explanation. It was just this organic moment of, we don't want this guy to get this. And we're yeah. going to work together to make sure that he doesn't. And at one point, I nearly caught this kid and he just threw his sunglasses at arm's length. They hit the tarmac. They bounced like that high off the tarmac. And this little girl ran past and caught it on the, on the volley, on the half volley, one-handed. And I just realized there's no way I could ever set that up. No, no, not There's at all. There's no way in a million years no. I could have ever set that up. We, you, you could give me like cones, animations, PowerPoint. Um, we could have practiced anything. Mm. But it, and it made me realize that, you know, if you can make them want the thing enough. Yeah. Uh, and you can give them something to incentivize them to work together. Um, you know, it's more powerful than anything you can tell them or anything you can, you can set up. And I had a few things... <laughs> Almost the same thing. A couple of weeks later, I was do, I was I set up a, a touch team for beginners, mm -hmm. and most of them had a background from other sports. They were quite good, like athletes, but they weren't they weren't rugby players. Yep. And there was one who was like really good softball <clears throat> player, and she could do everything. And there yep. was another one who was a volleyball player who was fast, and that was about it. And I tried to do everything I could to try and get the softball player to make space for the volleyball player and put her in the corner. Mm -hmm. Everything I could. I tried to explain it every way. I tried to incentivize them. I tried to uh, send them videos. And when the softball got the ball, she just wanted to step people and she didn't want to pass. And she could have someone on her shoulder and she just wouldn't pass. And we went to this tournament and they had a black uniform and one of them rocked up wearing this black lipstick. So they all put the black lipstick on for a bit of fun. And I said, and they had an important game coming up. And I said, if in the next game, she scores three tries in the left-hand corner, you can put that black lipstick on me. And in that game, within five minutes, they'd scored like six tries or something. 
Mm. And the softball player, literally, she turned into Joe Stanley. Yeah, right. She's just timing, flow, just put her in again and again and again and again. And I, and I realized that, again, it was like, however I'm trying to set it up, however good my, my pattern is, even if I'm absolutely right, you've got to find ways to make it important to them. Yeah. Because they're there for different reasons for you. Uh, you know, it might be important to them for a different reason. And if you can find out what that is and make it like real for them, it's actually yeah. more effective than technical coaching or a really good drill. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that, that, those sorts of two things were real like, eye-openers for me. Um, it's just <clears throat> make them play and make it important to them and yeah. all the other stuff will take care of itself, you know? So I need sunglasses and black lipstick. Yeah, and we can take and we can take combo. over the world. Take over the world. <laughs> and if you everyone, everyone has their like black lipstick or yep. you know that yeah. thing that they like, yeah. you know. If if you'd have worked out about the black lipstick six weeks earlier, it would have made your uh, life less stressful. <laughs> or, or maybe I'd get more funny looks. But yeah, yeah, yeah I know, right? Um, no, that's then that's a good that's a good takeaway for young coaches out there. Sometimes you just got to find the right um, incentive for the players to do like yeah, they might be having fun, but what's it? What's what's the carrot at the end of the stick? Um, and like you said, like black lipstick. Who who'd have thought? Who who'd have thought that black lipstick was the incentive to get those girls to do what you wanted them to do? You know. Um, but it was interesting because it showed that they always had the tools to do it. Yeah, yeah. They just had you to know. get the right, the right motivation behind them. And I didn't even realise that they could do it. I thought I had to teach them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which was, again, a surprise to me. It's just they always had that ability at some level. It just probably wasn't that important to them. Yeah, and that's, that's something that young coaches can take away from it. Once you find what the drive is, sometimes you don't have to teach it. You put something like you said. You put that on the line. You you score three tries in that corner. I'm going to do this. Well, you know they'll score six just to make sure that you do do it, and you haven't had to ta teach them anything. So, so that's a really good takeaway um, for some of the for some of the young coaches out there. Um, so, what are some of the besides those two that we've just talked about? What are some of the lessons that you've learned over your time in? coaching whether that's your snc again your snc stuff or in your rugby stuff i mean i think snc is very different because you might you probably have an idea of like i actually want this person to do this exact movement and i know the movements that they're capable of <coughs> and i know the speed that i want it at and i know the, the load i want it at and you can yep. be really like pedantic because you know yep. exactly what you want and the adaptation you want yep but I think rugby is quite different um, in terms of after three phases, it's chaos. Yeah. And you don't really have like someone like coming on the field, doing a Razzie Erasmus and like giving people advice, like as a water boy, mm -hmm. you kind of need them to, to come up with like solutions at grassroots on their own. Um, because it's actually not about winning. It's about developing those like, decision-making abilities and you know, so that, they can do stuff with it later, either down the line or like not even down the line as rugby players. So I think if you can actually almost make yourself redundant, like make players understand that, you know, uh, they can try things and it can go wrong. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of like showing people make mistakes in games where they score a try from the mistake. Yeah or showing players make mistakes in games where they go on to win that game. Um, and, and if you can get players to understand that it's actually, it's, it's part of the game to try things and not expect them to, to work and not see it as a failure if they don't work, because mm -hmm. that's, that's just part of it. And to have them like be really confident in being able to solve the problem themselves. So I think if you can, get rid of the illusion of control like yeah. if you think that you can control the session or control the game you're probably in the wrong sport yeah 
and you, you probably want to set up an environment where you don't have your cones placed perfectly and you you know you don't have the drill like done exactly the way that it, it was on like you know the youtube video mm. but you actually say well, what does this team need what what can i probably improve that's going to give them like maximum return on the investment and can they do it themselves in a game not can they do it in a drill uh, that's what that's been been for me is just like trying to sort of like transfer control over to the players and make sure it's a game like can they do this in a game because a drill is just like it's not it's it's fine to practice things but it's it's not a reliable indicator of whether or not they can do it when they're tired uh when they're under pressure and when there's someone there trying to stop them from doing it yeah oh absolutely you know um ta tackle bags are a prime example because they don't hit back they don't yeah. move you know um and you'll see coaches out there with tackle bags getting kids to tackle a bag for 20 minutes and the bag doesn't move you just go well, and they're queuing to do it yeah yeah so it's not even like two kids want back no there'll be like a line of them waiting to have their crack at the back yeah and it's usually you know one of the dads is holding the, the bag or the shield or whatever so that doesn't move so when they actually then come up against a kid their own size and actually tackle the guy and he moves, they don't know what to do. They stop because they're not used to that post tack. What happens up when that bag moves or what if it actually doesn't move when I hit a kid the same size as me? And yeah, that's getting them to make those decisions and, and play those games. Um, it's a really good point that you made about, um, you said it's not about winning. And I think, I think a lot of, young coaches at the start of their career are all about winning because um, well, not all about winning but the winning is the important thing um, and I think once you've coached for a little while you actually understand that the winning is the byproduct mm. of the develop if it's fun and it, they're developing the winning will happen so you you You've just got to get that balance right, like you said, to, to make it. If they're having fun, they're winning. Hmm. You know, um, so that's, I think, where a lot of young coaches get too caught up in the, oh, I'm not, I didn't win a game this year. Yeah, but we went from, you know, first game we got beat 85 nil, and the last game we got beat 10 nil. Well, that's that's a win. That's de that's development. Um and I think it takes a while for coaches to understand that when, when they're new to coaching. But I think you'll win more games than you lose if you don't try and win, but you try and improve their skills. Yeah. Um, and if you, so if you'd like say to a group of, I mean, like I've worked with a team here uh, and like, I'm, you know, I know I could do stuff with their wrestling. Mm. I know I could make them better wrestlers. Mm -hmm. and, and I know I can make them faster. Um, but that's not the feedback I've got from them for what they wanted to get at. Yeah. They want to develop game sense yep. and they want to develop, like, you know, uh, get really good at moves and be able to put each other into space and identify space or make space if it's not that. So that's what we worked on. And they've got better at that and they're enjoying it. And they're loving it. And teams that they couldn't beat before, they're now beating. Yeah. And teams that they'd normally be on like par with, they just, they can blow them away. Mm. Um, but it's not about what I wanted them to get good at. It was well, what do they want to actually get good at? Yeah. You know, and, if, and if you go like, you know, most kids, they want to play with their friends. Mm -hmm. They want to have fun. Um, but they also want to get better at certain skills. And it's the skills they're interested in. Yeah. And if you, if you get that, and unless it's like really random skills, like you've got like 20, 20 kids who all want to get better at line out throwing, then yeah, you're probably, you're probably you cannot have enough sort of people, yeah. you cannot have enough people that can drive properly to a line out. Fair enough. But that's the only <laughs> skill they, that's the only skill they want to develop. Yeah, yeah I know, right. I know, I know. You're probably not going to get much out of that. Um, but if you give them some options and you like, you know, try and like lead them to sort of things that you, you and it, it, like if you've got guys that just can't do something mm -hmm. rather than say, you guys are shit and you can't do this and you need to work on this. Yeah. Wait until they have a game where they get caught out. Yeah. 
and wait until they had that game where they, they really couldn't do the thing that, you know, they couldn't do. Mm -hmm. And you show them the footage and go, hey, do you think this is something we could work on? Yeah. And if it's really bad, they won't want to get embarrassed and I'll go, yeah, we probably should. Um, but if it's not that bad, maybe you as a coach are over fixating on something that's not that big a problem. Yeah. Because that's the thing. The other thing you can do as a coach is you can go and play, you can go and play a team and, you know, you could go, I mean, just give you a real world example. Like I worked with a team that couldn't see space. <clears throat> they couldn't number off. They couldn't understand like, you know, you know, we outnumber them. We don't outnumber them there. Uh, when they didn't have the ball, they weren't like, you know, numbering off against the right amount of attack. So like they just it was totally uneven. They went from, and doing like almost like under 10 stuff where one guy would get the ball, he'd have like a, a three on two or four on two and he'd, he'd try and run on, on the outside and just yep. waste the, the space the guys outside him. Um, and they went from doing that to seeing where the space was and attacking it and just, and being so organized because they had developed some game speed that they understood <clears throat> that if we're structured, we're giving them time to get ready. Let's yep. just play. Let's just, we scored tries from the prop playing nine. Yeah, because he understood that rock is one, and I've got a guy calling for it. Let's go. And in the process of that, like we dropped like two balls from like set piece moves from I think from scrums or mm -hmm. lineups or something like that. And the other coaches were like, "Oh, we're dropping passes." And I'm like, "You've gone from a team that can't see space." Mm -hmm and can't play as a unit to a team that is like blowing their other team away and the refs actually calling time early because the other team have had enough and you're focusing on a couple of drop passes yeah what's what's the end result and what's the big picture that we that we want to achieve so that's the thing is the coaches can focus on like you know they'll they'll they'll, they'll do a course where they're told this is the most important thing for your team uh, and they'll watch a YouTube drill and they go, this is the most important thing for your team. And then that thing isn't working. So they'll focus all their energy on fixing that, but it might not actually be the most important thing for your team. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you, you'll watch any team and you'll see, you'll probably see two things. It will be the thing that they're good at, the thing that is their natural strength of how they're going to score their points. And the other thing would be the thing that you could probably improve the most that will give you like a big return on your investments. And unless you're like a professional team and you've got like support staff, a lot of the other stuff you probably won't have time for. Yeah. So take yeah, those two things and try and make them fun. Yep. And that's and try and, that's, and get buy in. Yep. And that's your team identity then. That this is what we're really good at and this is what we're gonna do. Yeah. <coughs> so, um, it makes sense. It really does. Um, and hopefully the, the people listening can implement it at some point into their okay. teams. Pick up. And when you, I've, I've coached teams where I'm the only coach. And like, yeah, I'm, I'm a scrum coach. I'm a forwards coach. That's what I love. But when, when do I have time if I'm the only coach to do that? Mm. So we actually went and worked out, well, what are we, what are we really good at? They were really good at unstructured play. So let's just play unstructured play. Um, because I didn't, A, I didn't have the time or the resources to, like you said, to nut down those little one and two percenters that, that we can do. And you know what? The, the team didn't do too bad. Mm. So we're actually doing what they were good at and they had fun doing it. Um, so yeah, that, that makes a hell of a lot of sense, mate. Um, finding out what works for you. Um, so just thinking about, and this is, this would be interesting to get your thoughts because of where, where you're geographically coaching, how do you think as a coach, you can improve the game or the players at the grassroots level? And there's a few big problems here. Um, one is, uh, the sort of emphasis on preparing for contact. Mm -hmm. So if you think, um, you've got to do that like from a safety perspective and like from a performance perspective, but it's, it's overemphasized, I think. And you'll have guys who are holding a tackle bag, lining up to hit the tackle bag and form a ruck on that tackle bag. 
And if you think about it from like an enjoyment point of view, you know, guys want to play, they want to offload, they want to step, you know, they want to be able to do that. Um, if you think about it from a safety point of view, um, deliberately taking contact has a, has a toll. Uh, if you think about it from a concussion point of view, you know, you know, deliberately avoiding contact is, is, is probably going to protect you a little bit. Uh, and that's going to be a big problem here soon. Um, if you think about it from a performance point of view, like the teams that actually want to win, try and keep their ruck count down. Yep. Uh, they actually try and like let the opposition have some of the position because it's, you know, and try and score on the counter attack. <laughs> so if you, if you're like, if you're teaching guys that your job is to run straight into the opposition and set up a ruck, uh, you're, taking away the ability to offload, taking away the ability to step, taking away the ability to actually like read what's going on on either side of, the, of that player. Um, so just running into space and, and understanding how to make space when it's not there, that's, that's not being taught yet. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's the problem. Another problem is the, uh, the, the reliance on structures that come from professional setups. So the guys that you're getting like professional set up, they usually have got there out of an academy system because they could do everything quite well. Uh, they could do a two on one, they could rock, they probably have fairly decent body positions. Um, they can probably, you know, do some fairly decent things in the gym and they can probably defend okay. So when you've got a situation like that, where people who aren't gonna make really stupid mistakes in defense, you need something like a pod to draw defenders in and you need something like a pod to try and like smash up the defense to make it a little bit mis disorganized mm -hmm. um, but if you've got like you know <coughs> under 12s who are already disorganized they're not playing eyes up rugby they're not looking to like you know see where the attack is coming from or, or where the defense is you don't actually need a pod necessarily and so what it's doing is, is it's slowing down the game. So I've seen guys forming a pod for a ruck that hasn't even been won. Yeah. So it's getting in the way of decision-making. I've seen teams put a pod in front of a 10 so that the 10 can't see what's happening. And he's going to get slower ball when he does get it. So you're hurting his ability to sort of play the game and make decisions. And then the other thing is I've seen pod, uh, sorry, like, structures taken from like you know pro 14 or something so it's actually way too difficult for kids at that level anyway mm. it's it, it's for guys who just you know make really good decisions and they get to train together like minimum five times a week yeah and that's the thing it's that how much time do they what those pro players get together to train those you know those things that people see you know, a super rugby team or a top 14 team or a team from the premiership do it. And they go, oh, we're going to run that next week. Mm, mate, they've probably been working on it for like six or seven weeks on top of even everything else school. they do. <clears throat> yeah. But even a boarding school in New Zealand or something, they might do that and they can because they'll train together time. however many times yeah. a week and then yeah. they'll play touch all afternoon <clears throat> together yeah. when training's over. Yeah. You know? But if you've got guys you train two times a week, and they don't have that sort of rugby vocabulary and they don't have that kind of rugby context and they yeah. haven't learned the decision-making skills. Yeah. You know, you, you, you just, you're just robbing them of, um, of being able to play, play a good game. You know, you know you're, you're actually taking skills away from them and yeah. you're probably going to get more injuries because the guy's going to be used, you know, just to... Cannon fodder. Yeah, basically. Because I really... Yeah, and there's another big problem here, though, is, is that specialisation, is that they're trying to get guys who are like, you are this position. Oh, you yeah. are this position. You are this position. And it's not just that they're not developing a broad skill set, um, but it, it slows the play down because it's, I have to wait for the nine to be here to do that because he's the nine. Yeah, and right. I, I can't do that because <laughs> I'm not the ten. And... Um, and not only does it slow the play down, it sets up that sort of single point of failure where we only have one guy who can do this. We only have one guy who can take the place kicks and the rest of it. And it's just like, don't be afraid to miss. Mm. 
don't be afraid to like you're there pass it to this guy you know you don't have to be the 10 you're the first guy there your first receiver don't worry about it mm. just you know make a decision be confident you know don't don't blame each other um so it's like i think those big things it's, it's like they're taking stuff from professional that's like completely inappropriate for guys who are like 14 um and they're not letting them play they're not letting them experiment they're not letting them fail and they're uh, they're not letting them try a broad range of positions um yeah those, those are the those are the bigger problems i've seen for me yeah and it's probably i've seen that too with some of the rep stuff we do we get kids turn up and they go oh i play in this position and you just look at the kid and you go no I know why your coach has you there mm. because, you know, you might be the biggest ball carrier, so they'll play you at 12 or 13, but you're not going to play. At, if you want to go anywhere, you are not going to be, you know, um, and that, that's an issue everywhere, unfortunately. Um, <clears throat> it was interesting you referenced there a couple of times about avoiding the contact and that stuff around the concussion and, and the, you know, on a, and, I know there's a lot of research around it and, and you, you probably know a bit more on the research side of it. Um, I was listening to a podcast, some, I can't remember what it was, um, and they were talking about one of the teams in the Gallagher Premiership have actually reduced their contact sessions. In like pre-season, yes, they get the body, so they're used to the contact. And as soon as they hit the season, they might, they might limit it to... X amount of minutes at training because they know they've got, you know, game, this, that. So they're actually trying to um, manage the players and the player welfare and what, and the concussion and all, you know, the soft tissue stuff. And, and it's quite interesting that that's come out and um, it'll be interesting to see how that goes. If it'll filter through um, to some of the other clubs and some, will it become best practice? I'd, don't know um i can see that some coaches won't do it because it's i mean at that level it is about winning where at the grassroots level it's not about winning but we've also got to be able to you know teach the kids how to tackle how to and how to do that contact stuff but where do we where do we draw the line and go well, that's enough for this week um mm. If, if, if that sort of makes sense, if no, perfectly. I mean, this is this is another thing I think that um, coaches don't do enough of um, is just think about the demands of the game and make it specific to your level. And if there's no data on it, watch some games. Like mm. because yeah. I know a lot of coaches who they'll watch like every game in the Curry Camp, and they actually won't watch like you know footage of their own team play. Um, and it's like, that's, that's the, the most valuable data for you is what yep. your team is really doing. And so like, there was a thing that happened a few years back where, uh, like a lot of the Aussie bowl, fast bowlers, like all getting stress fractures. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember which, I can't remember which like Ashes tour it was, but what had been happening is they'd been saying, look, fast bowling is really demanding. So we're going to put a cap on how many overs they, they bowl or how many things they do in the yep. nets and all the rest of it yep. and the cap was I think it was like significantly below what the demands of the test match was yeah so then when they hit the test match it was just like this is not something they've been exposed to mm. so if you think about like if you're going to reduce load you need the load to still be high enough that it mimics the demands of what you want them to be able to do yeah yeah. Uh, so it's it's it, you know too too much um, too much prevention can actually hurt you know actually hurt them. Yeah. Um, so it's just a good example. It's like you know with scrums, it's like you think about how many scrums you have in a game. Mm -hmm. You you wouldn't want to expose them to double that in a session. No, just a basic principle like that, and you can think yeah. about the same in terms of contact. Um, and if you have like a, a day where you, you had like a, a match where you had like an, a high number of scrums and then you come into the back of that and training and you're really angry by the way that they scrum. So you want to do a special scrum session that actually from a low point of view might be the worst time to do it. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Even though instinctively that's when you want to do it. So yep. you could think about like, okay, well, maybe we could do some technical work where the load isn't that great. Or, you know, maybe we could do like a very low load and we could build back up. But so it's, it's, it's about the answers will actually be in your game. Mm. And it's, it gets quite complicated to people and they get quite intimidated when they think, well, how many tackles do I need to do and blah, blah, blah. But if you're letting them play enough games, they'll get the exposure yeah. that they actually need. Yeah. So if you're, if you're using games as a conditioning tool or if you're using games as a teaching tool, the exposure will usually take care of itself provided the timing's right and the numbers on the field are right. Or if you're yeah. doing like much smaller sided games, obviously you need to like lower the timing um, so they don't get overexposed. Yeah. 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 Another simple trick is just don't do things back to back. Yeah. Like give them days off in between. Yeah. yeah. So I might do, I, I like to do with contact. I like the moves that they're good at and they're confident with, we do them against contact. Yep. Yeah. And when it doesn't work make sure instead of being negative you're always congratulating the defense instead of like giving yeah, the yeah. to the attack yeah. you go well done guys well done you stop that again and you, and you put it back on the attack and you go this is really great guys because we can defend against this you know mm. you just frame it positive there's no need to like add extra sort of pressure like that but then mm. the moves they're not good you know and they need to practice we do that maybe on the next day against touch yeah uh, so they're, just, they're getting that like natural break from excess contact, but yep. you're actually putting the contact against something that they can do. Yeah. And so, you, so you're testing it at the same time you're exposing it. Yeah. And you're giving them that confidence as well that they can actually do it mm. without the con like, without the contact. Mm. So they can run that without knowing that, that they're going to get, yes, they're going to get touched or whatever, but they're not going to get tackled and they're not going to get, you know, they're not going to get belted into touch or whatever um, until they're confident in what they're doing. Uh, that, that makes perfect sense to me, Matt. Um, yeah. And, um, you can even give them the option, you know, when you say, do you want to try this against contact now? Do you think you're ready? Mm. You know, and you can put it on them. Um, <laughs> but then just remind them, well, we did contact on Tuesday. So, you know, maybe we do something else. Um, you know. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't always work. You know, you'll get enough people that turn up without their mouth guard and the other coaches don't want to do tackling and, you know, it's, it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't always work, but. Uh, no, of course. Yeah. No, that's, that's some good insight there, mate. Um, so, and I reckon I know how this conversation is going to go is how do you keep your training environment enjoyable for your athletes? So like in the, in the winter when it's, you know, cold and horrible and they could probably find a thousand excuses why not to be there what do you do with them to keep them turning up keep it enjoyable for them i just think it's games yep like i think if you make it games um and you give them the opportunity to compete against each other and with each other um that's really why they're there uh and so if you get everything that you do um, you can try and make a game of it and you try, I mean, I'm a big fan of doing like, um, time frames based on the energy system I'm trying to develop or the, uh, the ball and play time for that code, uh, at that level so that it's specific, it's quite safe. Yeah. You know, they're not going to get overexposed to something. Um, yep. or if they do, it's like just enough overexposure that's probably making them more conditioned for the actual sport that they're playing. Um, but yeah. they, yeah, they generally want to play. And I think if you, um, a lot of people say like stuff about kids coaching, like, you know, make this more fun, make this a game and all the rest of it. I don't think people grow out of that. Uh, I think if you do it with adults, <laughs> they enjoy it too. Um, generally, if you treat adult sessions like kids sessions, you know, you just let them play. They just behave more like kids. Mm. I don't, I don't know how many like coaching courses you've been on where they've done like a, a, a drill for kids and they make like all these like men in their forties do it and they just start behaving like kids once they do the drill and they yeah. just, you know, they just let go. So if you just let them play games, um, yeah. that really helps. And another thing is like, um, things like forfeits. So, you know, you do this, um, 
the winner has to like you know so the loser has to sing a song chosen by the winner you know uh the the loser has to do this dance you know um things like uh i mean there's one someone suggested to me which was i haven't done this yet which is like uh it was even it was a kicking thing and it was like whoever like you know missed the most kicks or something i can't remember it was like the winner got to text the loser's girlfriend from their phone oh and so, <laughs> no no pressure no pressure but, but if you can if you can start putting stuff like that yeah so yeah. it's just but 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 get it from them yeah because the stuff that like we're we're sort of like interested in it just might be so out of touch for guys who are 18 you know mm. you're just like what are yeah. you talking about like, yeah yeah you know, um but if you can if you can sort of say like what would be a good forfeit yeah um and then it's their forfeit um they're more likely to enforce it as well um yeah but to think just the things like that to give and give them ownership of stuff so i just find like you know i'll i'll do things where i'll say like what do you want to get good at mm -hmm. so do you want to do you want to do you want to be a fast back line do you want to be a back line with really good game sense do you want to be a back line that does really fancy moves you want do you want to what do you want to get good at and the thing that they've picked that it's their thing you know yeah it's the thing that they said that they wanted to do um, and it's also that's a double edged sword because you can hold them to it because instead of like saying, hey, I expect you to do blah, blah, blah. You're saying, do you really think the way we're carrying on right now, do you really think we're going to be the best back line? If, you know, yeah. Yeah. Because you, know, you guys told me you want to develop X, Y, and Z. Like, are we going to develop X, Y, and Z? Like, and they're like, no, no. Okay, fair enough. No, we're not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, just like drawing stuff from them, you know. Yeah. Giving them that ownership around um the behaviors and the ex their expectations and their standards mm -hmm. around what what um what do we expect what do you guys expect as a team what do you mm -hmm. what's the minimum standard you guys are going to accept around this and that and yeah <clears throat> i don't know the senior club i'm with we've got a a group i suppose loosely it's a leadership group and they look after a lot of the, um, the the fines, you know, which is easy enough to do when you're in a senior team because it's usually beers and you know that type of stuff. And and yeah, they I don't get involved in it. They they monitor. They do all that themselves. And you know, guys leave stuff at train. If you leave gear at training, it's this and that. And you know, and a it's fun and. You know, it gives them that accountability. So no, that's 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 some good good stuff there, mate. The other yeah. thing I think keeps people engaged, I think as well, is um, talking. Like this is something I'm really bad at. It's like I can talk and talk and talk and talk. So instinctively, it's not like naturally where I want to go to. But I've seen how effective it is if you just don't talk. You just go two things. It's two things that we're doing. Maximum two things. Go away and do it. And then you stop when you need to stop. And you don't talk. You ask them, did that work? How can we fix it? Comms. And if, you, if that, you're getting them engaged, they're engaged yeah. in a session. It's their session. It's their solution. Yeah. It's their, you know. And then it starts to happen in games. Like, I remember the last game we played. We played against this team that they hadn't beaten before. Um... And even though like their coach refed and he just cheated and he cheated and he cheated and he kept changing the rules, we still beat them. Mm. And I was like, there was no input from me. I was just on the sideline filming it. Um, our captain walked up at one point and said, well, what do, you, what do you think about this? And I was like, what do you think? And he was like, well, we need to do this. We need to do this. We need to do that. He didn't need any help from me. He had sussed out the situation. And they went and they beat them. Yeah. You know, um, they tried to change up that they weren't really quite ready to change up the thing, but that had been come from not me giving them speeches. Yep. That had been come from letting them play and play and play and play and try stuff. And when it didn't work, thinking about why it didn't work and trying again or trying something different. Yeah. And then that translates yeah. over into the game. But I think that keeps people engaged because it's it's their thing. It's yeah. their solutions. It's you know, it's their take, you know. And and I and I think you've 
you've got a good point there as as coaches and I know I'm still I still struggle with it at times is the silence mm. like you you'll you'll ask you give them a question and I think it's just human nature when there's silence we've got to fill it mm. and if you'd have given them like two seconds extra you could see they're trying to facilitate they're trying to work out what they need to say mm. and you know what you know what you want them to say mm. so you end up going oh this is what this is what I want you to do and I'll go mm. oh, okay and they don't actually then do they not do they understand what you want them to do or are they just uh, yes oh that's what that's what you want us to do that's really good um yeah so that's something that that i've identified as one of my things i've just got to be able to go you know what just let them just let them have an extra five seconds to think about what their answer is going to be um and then drill on that answer of course like you said usually you go what what can we do better in that drill uh comms okay what do we mean by comms well mm -hmm. you know you know comms no i don't know what you mean what do you mean you know talking no and like now we've now we've got them thinking about their answer and then you know that that type of stuff um the other thing you can do is let them try again so if you ask yeah. a question and then like you ask and there's no answer you go hey, don't worry let's play again have another think yeah think yeah. about it now uh, so i'll do that where i'll give one team moves that they're going to do and the other team different moves I'll, yeah. like, I'll have a piece of paper and I'll say it's like, you know, a zoo animal is an unders line and a farm animal is an overs line. Go away. And I'll give the other team something different. And then they'll play for like, you know, the set period. That I want them to get the conditioning effect. And then I stop and they bring them in and they go, how are they trying to score their points? Yeah. And they, they usually don't get it the first time. They, I, they usually don't have an answer for me. And I'm like, okay, well now go away and think about that because you're going to play mm. them again. Mm. you know and then they go and go oh well they were doing raps and there was something else but i didn't pick about what that was and i'll go okay no worries so how do you stop the rap what could you do to stop the rap go away again yeah and it's not necessarily about having the answer it's about developing that like well, what are they trying to do and what can we do about it together yeah um and if they're making that decision even if the decision's wrong Mm. okay now we've got something we can work with mm. oh i think this is how i defend the rap okay that's cool that you think that but this is probably this is the way i would like you to do it but at least in you, they've got that understanding of okay cool I, I know what that is what that is blah 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 instead of just going yep that's what that's because they all yep this is what you want i know that's what you want me to do but they don't know um, no. But but then you could take it back a stage and that's where like a drill would be useful. So like but you've got your way you want them to defend a rap and they've got their way they came up with. Yeah. And so then you do attack and defense and you do the rap and then you'd be like, right, I want you to try and defend it like scenario A. You do a few and then you try and defend it scenario B. And then you don't tell them which was better. You say to the guys who are actually doing the rap, how did it feel? Mm. How yeah. did it feel yeah. when it, and if if you're right. They'll know you're, you're, you know, they'll know. Yeah. And if, but if you're not right by that much, it doesn't matter. No. And then you've learned something. Exactly. You know? Yeah. No, that's, that's, and I think that's where, um, when we start on that coaching thing, we're all sort of wanted everything regimented and this is, we're going to run mm. this pattern and that pattern and mm. this shape and two passes off the 10, and then we're going to run an unders line and, and rugby's not like that. You know, even at the top level, it doesn't always go, you know, the way you want it to go. Um, no. Just, just developing that. Like you said, developing decision makers is probably the big big lack that we don't have um, in a lot of the coaches. Um, cool. No, thanks. Thanks, Tom. That's been awesome. Um nice chatting with you, man. Yeah, no worries. So just think back to when you started as a coach. What... If you could give yourself some advice as that, you know, first first time you went out coaching or in that first six months, what what advice would you give yourself back then, knowing what you know, knowing what you know now? I'd find out what they want to get out of it. Yep. Let them play. Mm -hmm. And two bits of information. Yeah, nice and simple. 
Yeah. Yeah. Nice. I like it. I like it. No, that's that's good. Good advice. Nice and simple. Don't overcomplicate it. Keep it fun. Yeah. Nice. I like it. No, that's really good, mate. Um, I know you're a busy man. You, you're off to work. Uh, everyone's busy, man. Everyone's busy. Everyone's busy. <laughs> yeah. No, I really, really appreciate your time, mate. Um, it's been good. There's some little bits of gold in there that, that I took away from it. So hopefully uh, the people Thanks listening took hopes. something away from it. Um, yeah, like I, I said, mate, if, use it. If, if one person gets one thing out of it, that's a success for me. Um, yeah, that's what I thought too, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, so thanks, mate. I really appreciate your time. Um, and I'll let you know when this gets uploaded and you can promote it however you like. Um, I, might, I might chuck it on LinkedIn or something like that. Yeah, yeah, go. However you want to do it, mate. Yeah. So um, good luck with the rest of the year, mate. Um, thanks, man. You too. Hope, hope you get out. Are you out of lockdown over there or? There's a chance we might be going back into one, but like we're, I think we're out of it at the moment. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So, um, but like no training at the moment. I'm doing like something with like league and touch, but union, like the pitches are closed at the moment because mm -hmm. they're, they're giving the grass a break because it had, we had such a busy season. It's crazy. <sighs> it's like normally this time of year, they give the grass a break, but it's like, yeah. guys, we haven't been playing. We've, we've had like hardly any games. Yeah, you know, yeah. But it's just German, like, lack of common sense. <laughs> cool. All right, mate. Thank you very much. All right, then. And the their own ball. That is monstrous. Sleeping yeah. hounds at the back by the foot of Ben Norman. Kept in and England. Marching it on. Will they get a penalty?